Okay, good afternoon and welcome everyone to our webinar today on dealing with complaints effectively. This webinar is a bit different from the usual kind of webinar that we do regularly. This is a roundtable discussion between some of our consultants and some solicitors as, and uh, accountants as well. Today with us, we have Sarah Charlton of Sharnwood Accountants. We have Rhiannon Cambrook Woods of RHL Solicitors and Paul Whiteman from our very own DG Legal. For those of you who haven't joined our webinars before, my name's Aaron and I'm an assistant consultant at DG Legal. So, how it's going to work today is I'm going to kick off the discussion, the questioning by asking the panelists a couple of questions that we've asked before that we think are still very pertinent. But if you have any questions yourselves, we very much hope you do, please pop your questions in the chat function. And what we'll do is then we'll start answering all of your questions to make sure we can get through as many as possible in the hour. So if you have any questions, please pop them in the chat function and we'll get through to as many as possible. Um, let's start off with a couple that we already have prepared. So the first question, that I'm going to ask our panelists today is what tips can you give for effective complaints handling to avoid escalation to the legal omb uh, legal ombudsman? Sorry, Paul, if we could start with you, please. What tips can you give us? Yes, yeah, sure. Sure, Aaron, thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because effective complaints handling, there is no golden formula which has magic solutions and, and resolves every complaint so that it never escalates. Um, having worn the hat and sort of sat the other side of the fence as a legal ombudsman for three years, I suppose I have seen a number of examples of what I would consider is bad complaints handling and a number of issues that have come up. I mean, for a matter not to escalate to the legal ombudsman, um, it always takes um, a reasonable response and to some extent, a re you know, a reasonable complainant who's willing to listen to the response. But in terms of some of the common complaints um, that um, and some of the mistakes that lead to an escalation, firstly, um, it may sound like common sense, but an awful lot of the complaints that do escalate, the firm has not actually identified properly all of the issues. Um, it becomes almost like an extension of an ongoing argument, I find, in some cases. It's quite frustrating in some instances where it's not done well, and clearly there has already been a um, fallout between the, uh, the fee owner and the client for a variety of reasons. Sometimes, you know, the, uh, the client has been difficult. Sometimes the firm themselves have not covered themselves in glory. But by the time it comes to the complaints handling procedure, I always recommend if it's been done well, it's almost like an opportunity for the firm to put things right. It's almost like a service. Your, your formal internal complaints procedure should be a mechanism that the um, disgruntled client feels they have some confidence will bring a fresh pair of eyes to it um, and that it will be a genuine opportunity um, to put things right. I think, therefore, it is extremely important that you don't get embroiled in perhaps one of the main issues that you actually take some time to take a step back and independently look at all of the issues that are being raised to ensure that you've got a comprehensive list, that you're not dealing with two of the most um, sort of difficult issues that you feel quite strongly about. Sometimes, um, you know, the complainant has been very vocal about some issues, but actually there's four or five issues that he's actually raising. Um, when it comes to the legal ombudsman, they will now undertake um, what's called a scoping exercise where they will look at all aspects of the complaint and they will have an agreed list, usually following a conversation with the uh, complainant, to agree a comprehensive list of issues that he wants the legal ombudsman to take forward, he or she wants the ombudsman to take forward. I would suggest as part of any good complaints handling process there, if you want to stop it escalating, that you adopt the same approach under your own internal complaints procedure. It is always sensible to um, undertake a comprehensive review before you get embroiled in the merits of the complaint itself. Identify impartially what those issues are and if in doubt, 
speak to the complainant, agree those issues and have a defined list that you are taking forward and do that before you get embroiled in the weeds and start discussing whether any of them are meritorious or whether any of the um, the issues are actually, you know, sort of mis misconceived entirely from the, from the word go. Then after that, I think it's extremely important that um, you deal with it honestly and from an evidence-based approach. It's very important really that it is seen as an impartial exercise that the, um, the client can have some confidence in. Um, it's always worth, I think, at the outset explaining that um, it's a process where the firm at the, at the end will provide a final response to all issues. And if the, the client is not satisfied, they will have the right to escalate it. That can be a, a, a strong point to actually reinforce confidence in the process that you're undertaking, um, that they will have a right at the end of it um, to have an independent um, set of eyes look over it. Um, it's then very important when you're actually looking at the issues that you've agreed with the complainant that you do undertake a, an evidence-based approach. You don't get personally involved in it. Sometimes there can be quite an emotional response from people dealing with complaints, particularly if they've had any involvement in the substantive matter to that stage. They feel really their professional credibility is being called into question, whereas even the best solicitor, things can go wrong. Um, and even if the complainant has got the wrong end of the stick or is being unreasonable, ultimately the complaints procedure is there to look at the evidence on the file to form a view that can be justified and to explain the reasons why the service has been reasonable if ultimately you know that, that's the case and to accept where it's been unreasonable. So when dealing with the complaints, you need to be honest and evidence-based. Where something has gone wrong, it is very important that a realistic view is taken um, of what has gone wrong and any redress that is required. I strongly re you know, recommend that anybody dealing with a complaint looks at the guidance that has been issued by the number of complaints that have been escalated where there have been findings of unreasonable service by the firm under their own procedure, but actually what's been suggested hasn't gone halfway to addressing some of the detriment that, has, you know, that the firm have almost acknowledged in their response has been... Um, um, incurred by the uh, complainant as a result of unreasonable service. Given that there is the right to escalate it, firms do need to be realistic. Um, they do need to look at the guidance and they do need to uh, make an offer um, in accordance with that guidance. Um, use the right tone, give a comprehensive response. Bear in mind as well that um, even then, if you've done all of those steps and you've provided a thoroughly reasonable response that deals with all of the issues, has identified any unreasonable service and has made an offer that you consider is unfair, even then, if the complainant considers that your, your um, response is not reasonable and wants to escalate it, the Ombudsman Scheme rules do then, if you've dealt with it properly and you've made an appropriate offer or if there was no merit in the complaint in the first instance, do give you a right to make your representations to the Ombudsman at the outset that it's not a matter they should be investigating, either because, you know, it's got no reasonable prospects of success, there's been no detriment, or you can say that the Ombudsman should not be investigating on the base is that you've already made a reasonable offer that remains open to acceptance. So if you follow those steps, while I can never say that it will prevent a, a matter being escalated, I believe you're maximising your opportunities, firstly, of getting a, a, an agreed resolution with the complainant, but secondly, um, of having rights under the Ombudsman scheme to, um, you know, to make representations that the Ombudsman shouldn't investigate it because you've already dealt with it in a reasonable manner. Brilliant. Thank you, Paul. Um, Rana, could you please give us your thoughts on this? Yeah, hi. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I, I think speed is of the essence here when dealing with complaints. Um, often people complain because they don't feel that they've been heard. Um, and therefore, um, the minute a complaint comes in, I think um, making sure that that individual, individual feels that, first of all, um, we're dealing with them quickly, um, that they are being heard and listened to, and that there is a plan of action. Um, in my decades of experience now with, with complaints, those tend to be the themes. But very rarely do you have a client who is complaining because something is technically incorrect. It is generally about um, response time times they don't like the advice they're being given because they don't like it not that it's incorrect 
um, and they don't feel that they're being heard. So I think in order to avoid this sort of escalation, because, you, you know, for, for anyone and everyone that's been to the legal ombudsman, it can be a lengthy process in terms of time and sometimes in terms of cost. It is actually through your efforts at dealing with it quickly and um, listening and hearing what they have to say and then having a plan of action. But importantly, making sure that that plan of action is then followed through in the agreed terms between you and, and the complainer, if at all possible. So that's what I would do. Thank you. Thank you, Rhiannon. And last but not least, Sarah, could you please give us your thoughts as well? Thanks very much, Aaron. I just wanted to touch on that whilst Aaron is completely correct, I am an accountant, um, so hopefully there's not too much hissing, um, but I am actually a consultant at DG Legal and I'm also a CEO of a small law firm in South West Wales. So I sort of um, wear both hats. I can't, uh, I, I won't even try to articulate my answer as um, uh, as well as Paula or Rhiannon, um, but the three things I would generally focus on is be honest, which is something that Paula touched on, you know, don't be afraid to, uh, you know, to, to own it if you have made a mistake. And I know that uh, Rhiannon has made the comment about being timely. So you don't want to be rushing and get your answer you know, um, get your facts, um, you know, not collect all of your facts and get the information, but you want to try and have some speed in relation to turning it around and being able to resolve it. And then I would sort of say again, something that uh, Paul has touched on about being as subject subjective as you can. Um, and Rhiannon also mentioned sort of client experience. So try to take yourself out of the emotional aspect that it's your law firm and that you feel really you know, protective and precious over it. Try to take yourself out and think about it from a client experience perspective, because as um, we had mentioned, it's not usually that um, a process is incorrect. It's more about the client's experience um, that you're really going to be addressing. That's great. Thank you, Sarah. Um, moving on now to the second question we have, who should deal with complaints and what are the benefits of them being dealt with by a senior member? Renan, if we could start with you on this one, please. Yeah, no problem at all. Um, I, I have to be honest with you. I think it does depend on the nature of the complaint and also the individual that you're dealing with. If it's a um, if, if simple thing of uh, nobody's responded to my email in 24 hours or in 48 hours, I think that is something that a fee owner should be able to deal with, address it quickly, and again, ensure that they answer that email and manage expectations. If, however, that this is what can um, often be the case, a vexatious complainer, somebody who is going to complain, even if you, you know, pulled out the red carpet and gave them a million pounds tomorrow, I, I think have the appropriate red flags on your system and escalate those appropriately. And um, sometimes, you know, people do just want to be heard. Um, and rightly or wrongly, if they think that they can get to what they perceive to be the top of the tree, that actually resolves things. And um, I know that's more difficult in much larger organisations, but I think making sure that your team are fully aware of what those escalation points should be, when should it, you know, um, go to a FIANA and then a team manager and then a senior operations manager, or when really should you actually save the vast number of hours of going between all of these people and jumping up? Is, is the right time to do. So um, I think in terms of them being dealt with a senior member, I, I think often if it is somebody who has complained on a number of occasions, then, then jump straight away really, or as quickly as you can. Um, otherwise your, your team members are going to be spending a large number of hours only to end up there in any event. Um, so I think it's really important of what is the nature of the complaint as the individual complained before, um, and, and, and do we think that that is a complaint of, of merit? Um, and do we think it's something that is going to escalate to be something far more complicated? Um, and a lot of that is educating your fee earners, your team managers and your team members in knowing what is a complaint and what is a complaint that should be escalated and not be afraid to escalate as well. Um, so it, it's a combination and, and adding those ingredients together and getting the complaint to the right individual at the right time. Um, but delay at your peril is what I say, because your your teams are going to be spending vast amount of hours unravelling something where really it could have been resolved very quickly if it had got the right person at the right time. Thank you, Ryan. Sarah, what are your thoughts on this? I would just say that um, 
on the more sort of serious complaints as Ari had alluded to, then I think that having a senior member of staff means that you're taking it seriously. Um, and I think that, you know, you can often take the emotion out of it because you're not the Fiona or you're not that department, head of department. So I think there's two benefits from it, but, but primarily from a client experience perspective, they feel that you're taking it, experience, ex um, taking it very seriously with someone, you know, senior, actually taking the time out of their day to deal with it. So I think that goes a long way to build bridges. Thank you. And Paul, oh, what are your opinions on this? Well, it's it's one of those things, it's not one size fits all. I mean, I, I can imagine in some firms um, who happen to be practicing areas that naturally generate a number of complaints, there may be valid reasons from a proportionality point of view that you don't want your managing director to spend, you know, sort of 80% of their working week dealing with complaints. So sometimes a degree of delegation may be appropriate. But I sometimes get sort of concerns from firms saying, um, you know, it's the complainant's not happy, it's independent. Um, the point with any firm's complaints procedure, it's never going to be wholly independent. It is always ultimately going to conclude with a response that is a response on behalf of the firm. But it does need to be credible. Um, so I think in terms of the seniority of the person who's dealing with it, Firstly, complainants can tell straight away if, if it is a junior person you have in charge dealing with a complaint who is ultimately looking at issues at more senior people, where ultimately they're not going to have that degree of autonomy or confidence to make a decision, um, even if you know the evidence shows there's been an unreasonable service. So I would say they need to have sufficient seniority to be able to make a decision uh, which has consequences for the business um, and will on occasions involve um, accepting responsibility on behalf of the uh, business, even where um, you know, partners may have been supervising the matter and may have come to a different decision. Otherwise, the, the process itself is not gonna be credible. I think as well, we need to bear in mind, although we talk about a lot of complaints and they are, you know, a lot of complaints can be about relatively trivial matters and there can be a quick resolution. But the legal ombudsman can award compensation up to 50,000. Um, on long-standing matters, it has the rights to um, reduce bills, um, you know, which is on top of that 50,000. So although these powers are not, you know, sort of... Um, in word only, I mean, I have been involved in cases at the legal ombudsman where the combined award was over 100,000, which if you are dealing with that under your own internal complaints procedure, therefore, or there can be consequences for the firm. Um, a lot of issues that um, your indemnity insurers would not want you um, delegating to a rather junior member of your staff. Um, can be covered within the legal ombudsman's jurisdiction. So it's important while you can, of course, you know, sort of delegate to a junior level and have a degree of senior, you know, staff sort of oversight. Um, if you do that, you know, and a lot of complaints, it's, um, it's getting that balance right because there can be a level of duplication. Um, a lot depends on your own complaint structure. I mean, there is nothing wrong at all. If you have more than one stage, um, you know, and actually the legal ombudsman rules require no more than one response within eight weeks. But a lot of firms I've seen sort of overcomplicate it and have sort of two stages of escalation. But I can see the point that a lot of firms do have one right of escalation. So maybe, you know, you have somebody at a more junior level looking at the first stage, but on the basis, if there is a right of escalation, it then goes to somebody more senior to have the final say on the complaint. I can see that may be a sort of proportionate compromise. Um, but ultimately, you know, my, my bottom line on it is that whoever you are dealing with it, it has to be at sufficient seniority to make it a credible process um, or of course outsourcing it or getting somebody independent to look at it um, with um, oversight from a senior partner to agree the uh, the awards can be another option which does build up that credibility. Aaron, can I just interject on uh, a point that Paul had made an observation just perhaps because I have a slightly differing view in relation to um, law firms potentially being a little bit biased because obviously it is their law firm um i would actually say if you spoke to any of the few owners 
um, at Eat Nems Morris, they probably tell you that I'm actually harsher because my expectations and the disappointment I have if they fall short. So I would say that whilst I anticipate as a legal ombudsman, you see a lot of that. I don't feel that's a true reflection of all law firms because sometimes when you hold your fee in, it's in such high regard and you know what they're capable of, there, you know, you are disappointed when they have, you know, when they have, and perhaps, you know, you know, your response will be transparent and reflect ha that disappointment. And I think that that goes a long way to building the trust up with the person that is complaining, because it, obviously they can see how upset and disappointed you are as a firm that you sell your services at this level. And whilst it might be compliant, it still may fall short of the level of service that your firm itself sells based on its pricing model. I tend to agree with Sarah there, actually. I, I've used the phrase maybe too often, but that it is not um, the level that I would expect. Um, and I do think, and it, again, it, it's about, um, and it's not playing with what the client wants to hear, because that is genuinely often how I do feel. Um, you know, we should be reaching standards. Um, and unfortunately, either through the pressures of work, and I haven't looked at a couple of firms that are on here, um, you know, some of you running high caseloads, et cetera, we've all been there. You know, it is difficult to keep all those balls in the air. And I don't think we should underestimate that either. Um, but I think acknowledging to a client that something has fallen short, actually, I think it takes the wind out of their sail as well. They're so surprised to hear you say that because it's not what they expect. They, affect, they expect the defensive. But actually, I think that does help pave the way as well. Um, and, and that does make a difference. Um, I, I think for a client to understand that us lawyers are sometimes a lot more humble than we may appear um, doesn't go, um, you know, doesn't go badly wrong either um, to realise that we are actually human and, and not sitting in some ivory towers. And I think actually having that approach with the client certainly does help um, to, to pave the way, um, you, you know, to hopefully foster a better relationship going forward for them. Aaron, if I could just very briefly come back, you know, um, just just to sort of clarify what I'm saying there, because I'm certainly not trying to suggest that all all uh, lawyers are biased and uh, not to be trusted by any means. Um, my point here, of course, is that it's perception, and there are a number of people, particularly people who are disgruntled and wanting to make a complaint, who may at um, the uh, stage of raising a formal complaint and deciding that actually it's not something the fee owner can do start to lose trust and there is a need for credibility so if, if it's escalated to somebody who is at a more junior level that can be a perception in terms of sarah's point that some people are you know sort of um you know gutted and wanting to make amends i've come across that i suppose the point is you know there's not one right answer in terms of response you get you know i think in the legal ombudsman you see a range of responses ranging from people where you think whoa you know calm down a bit you're making an offer there that's far too generous to people who really um see it as an extension of an argument as i say and actually see it as an opportunity to destroy somebody who they've fallen out with and they feel they're in a more powerful position so there is a range of responses you know that i come across and i think it varies you know we get some people who are very good at um you know dealing with complaints some people who aren't so good and you know that and, and and are causing it to sort of escalate and not give the best opportunity of seeking a resolution but my point there was not really a criticism of, of the um, solicitors as such it was really meant as uh, the perception and actually building confidence in people i think to be honest with you paul certainly um and i've seen this myself is this fear is on the more junior level do become exceptionally defensive and actually that complaint turns into an absolute nightmare because their response to the complaint was worse than the complaint in the first place so i think you, your point is very valid and um, i have seen that side of the coin as well where you think goodness me why didn't you just pass it over to someone more senior we wouldn't have you know had this level of escalation um but you know there's no size fits all either um you just yeah. never know these days how people are going to react That's brilliant. Thank you, everyone, for that discussion. Moving on to the next question. I quite like this one. It's got a bit of a philosophical element to it. Should we say sorry if we believe our service has been reasonable, or would this be an admission? Sarah, if we could start with you on this one, please. I'm a firm believer if you have made a mistake, um, it is about the client's experience. And I think that there's nothing wrong with um, admitting when you've done something wrong. Um, 
you tend to find that clients will complain for a, ver a variety of reasons and what they're looking for as a resolution also varies. So sometimes we've given people flowers, vouchers, sometimes we've discounted a bill. Um, I think Paul and Rihanna have both sort of echoed that there isn't one size fits all. I think anyone who's going to be responsible for dealing with complaints has to be good at reading people, has to be very, you know, you have to have very strong people skills. Your role there is to de-escalate. You know, it's not there to fan the flames, as we had mentioned, you know, that sometimes the responses have um, escalated it unnecessarily because it's been poorly worded. So I think that... Um, it's really important to, to, to listen to what the clients actually want. Again, sometimes it's just an apology. They're not looking for money. Not every client is looking to have, you know, the discount off their bill. Some of them just genuinely want you to recognize that you, you know, that what you did was wrong or you fell short or what you sold and what you delivered are two very different things. So I think if you, people who are, or oh, my experience tend to be good at managing complaints are people that, perhaps can look at it from a client stroke customer's perspective and then manage it from that perspective rather than from the law firm. Paul, what are your thoughts on this? Just to reiterate the question, um, should you say sorry if you believe your service has been reasonable? So absolutely, I think we can all agree where you know, a firm does realise they have been at fault, then an apology is an appropriate uh, part of the uh, the full package of recourse, so to speak. But what about a situation where a client's very disgruntled, but you've gone through your process and you've found that you have been reasonable, that there hasn't been any wrongdoing on your part, but the client is still disgruntled? Do you think you should say sorry in those circumstances? Or do you think it's a matter of sticking to your guns and kind of saying with integrity, we're not going to apologise for this because we're not in the wrong. Or do you think there's more of a, a people game? A uh, How would I describe it? Not a people pleasing, but uh, a game to be played in terms of still keeping that client as happy as possible. Yeah. Thank you, Anne. Um, I think um, there, you know, I think again, we can come back to there isn't one size fits all and I think if you just routinely shower out apologies when you're actually then denying that a complaint and everything else it can come across in some circumstances as disingenuous I know some firms feel a little bit sort of reluctant to make an apology in these circumstances because they're concerned that it may be deemed to be some sort of admission you know, afterwards if it does then escalate um, it's worth pointing out in this respect that the scheme rules do specifically address this point and they do state that an apology will not of itself be treated as an admission of liability. So I do think in some cases um, there is nothing wrong in even in cases where technically the service you have provided is reasonable and you believe that will be upheld by the legal ombudsman recognizing that for whatever reason the complainant's expectations have not been met in that case and it has led to them leading to a formal complaint and the process has obviously upset them i think there is nothing wrong to say that you know you're sorry that it didn't match their expectations and to um you know then give you reasons why you've actually made a finding where you haven't upheld it an apology in those circumstances as long as i think you know to reflect what sarah said you're actually listening to the complainant and it is relevant to the circumstances because showering, sorry, you know, and then um, it, it's, um, I have seen cases where, you know, people will say, I'm sorry you feel that, but you're clearly wrong. And I just think, well, that's not an apology, really. It's kind of just almost rubbing salt in, into the wound. So you do need to be a little bit careful, but I think there is scope in some cases to recognise that, even though actually what you've done is wrong, the complainant didn't understand that, you know, you didn't match their expectations and it's had an impact on them, albeit, you know, not a result of unreasonable service, which you can be sorry because you want to have satisfied customers. There are occasions when you've provided a reasonable service, but, you, you know, it's not always perfection that you're able to provide and, um, you know, you can apologise for that. So I do think that, it, you know, in some cases it is appropriate not in every case. I think you do have to listen to what the complainant is saying and, and, and match that to make sure, you know, you use it in appropriate circumstances. Yeah, just to interject before we hear from Rhiannon on this, uh, Jonathan Wellington has posted in the chat box, 
I tend to offer an apology that they're disappointed, which I think could potentially be an appropriate phrase uh, to use in a lot of circumstances. So thank you for that, Jonathan. I think that's very helpful. Um, Rhiannon, if we could hear from you on this, please. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think following from what Jonathan has said, um, it is, first of all, you know, let's hear, hear out the client, you hear what they have to say. Um, I think to, to say sorry for something that actually hasn't gone wrong um, equally undermines um, your team, your staff, um, and what they're trying to deliver. Um, and talk about browbeating if you're apologising for something that actually wasn't, wasn't bad in the first place. So I think understanding what the client's complaint is, is obviously key in that that throughout all of this and um, but I equally have said that you know I am sorry that they feel disappointed and I don't want them to feel that way and to just you know cover off exactly what has happened and um, and the expectation because of course sometimes the process is what's disappointing not in terms of of the actual activities that have been undertaken. Um, and I think certainly in the personal injury world, we're seeing more and more of that, isn't it? It's the process that is driving some of this and the client's frustrations, which are equally echoed by the fee owners and those alike. But I do think it's important to strike that balance between not constantly apologizing and saying sorry, when you have a whole host of wonderful team members out there who are actually genuinely trying their best. And on that occasion where they haven't fallen short, I, I think it's actually not Good to then apologise um, and, and undermine, you, you know, your team members, um, because that's not really a motivational factor either. So I think it's a fine balance to be had in, in understanding their grievance, you know, echoing that you are disappointed in the way that you feel, because we are disappointed when somebody isn't happy. Um, it's not what we want. Um, but I think equally, you know, there is an aspect there where we do need to be supporting um, the team members and, and, you know, giving them that confidence that actually what they did was correct and it wasn't failing on their part so it, it, it's a fine mixture and, and a fine balance to be had but um, it's important to see it from both sides of the coin i think michelle has just popped in the chat box i recently apologized to a client for her disappointment and the ombudsman have rung me to say that i accepted there was some disappointment so an award should follow and they want me to pay 100 pounds so as a, an anecdote for everybody just to be aware of. So I, I think that the whole point of this is it's a, it's a nuanced question and it's it's going to be very much dependent on the circumstances before you. And, you know, as all lawyers here know, you've got to be very careful with the words that you use. So it is going to be a case by case basis. And it's, all, it's at the end of the day going to be a judgment call, but you should also be very careful about how you apologise and what exactly you're apologising for. Okay, so moving on to the next question. We have a complaint from a beneficiary who is not our client. Are we obliged to deal with it or should we obtain consent of the executor first? So obviously this is a probate matter, it appears. Uh, Paul, could we start with you on this one, please? Well, I can come in quite briefly on that because ultimately um, it is very clear now under the old, you know, under the scheme rules that you do not have to be a client to raise a complaint. Um, rule 2.8c makes it absolutely clear that a residual beneficiary is entitled to raise a complaint about the service you are providing to an estate. And that is the case whether um, there is a lay executor involved or whether you are appointed as the executor yourself. It is is a slightly different approach to the, the previous legal complaint service um, approach where residual beneficiaries had a right to apply for a remuneration certificate. Anybody who's old, as old as me may remember remuneration certificates where res, resident, um, residual beneficiaries could challenge the costs. Um, but the legal complaint service was very reluctant to get involved with service complaints. They would draw the line, you know, as to whether you were a client or you were not. You know, the view was it was executors who were the clients. They got involved in very limited circumstances because clearly they were getting approached in extreme cases by um, residual beneficiaries saying, um, you know, the, uh, the solicitor was the sole executor and they've not contacted me for four years. It looks like they've run away with the money. And telling them to, um, you know, come back at the conclusion of the estate, or you know, raise it through the um, the executor in those circumstances was always, um, you know, clearly an inadequate response. But 
the um, the legal service um, ombudsman rules at the moment, whether you like it or not, um, do make it quite clear that um, a residual beneficiary has got a right to raise a complaint. So if you decide not to deal with it, um, if you even if you had a lay executor who said don't deal with it, as a firm, if you do not deal with it and, it, and the residual beneficiary then escalates to the ombudsman, um, the ombudsman will impose a fee unless you actually meet the requirements. So first of all, then there would need to be no poor service. But the second thing is you would need to show that under your own complaints procedure, you've taken all reasonable steps to um, deal with that complaint. So if it escalates to the ombudsman and you've taken a decision, even if told by the late um, executor, that you're not going to deal with it, it's very unlikely that you would um, be held to have taken all reasonable steps to deal with a complaint. So you are going to be on the hook then for a £400 um, case fee, which I very much doubt the executor would be willing to pay. Now, there are instances where you may be acting on behalf of the um, lay executor. You may be following the lay executor and the lay executor may have every right to be giving you instructions that the, res the residual beneficiary is not happy with. If you are going to say something about, the, you know, in dealing with a service complaint that is relevant to what um, the executor has instructed you, I would always advise that you seek their consent to do so. Most executors would not object to you dealing with a service complaint. Um, you can never say in contentious matters, never say never. You know, there can be things where um, it, it might become personal between, between the parties. But in most cases, um, the firm should be advising the lay executor that it's a you know that, that they wish to respond and, and justify the service um, that they are providing and the wish to provide a response. And if they are acting on the lay um, executor's instructions, or if they are the, ex the executor themselves and they feel they are um, acting reasonably, um, the point is, you know, it, I'm not saying that just because a residual beneficiary has complained that there's merit in the complaint. But the issue here, I think you're asking, is whether you should deal with the complaint. And you should deal with the complaint, but you should explain why actually it's not unreasonable service. You are following instructions of an executor. I wouldn't mind adding to um, Paul's because um, we do a lot of estates and probate work and uh, complaints from beneficiaries is a growing, it's an emerging area, especially with charities. Um, I think that the way, so from a practical perspective, when you're having to try and sort of field these um, issues, I think that our first approach is to try to encourage the beneficiaries to have a dialogue with the executors. Um, especially as Paul alluded to, where they they may lack experience in relation to it. The difficulty that you have um, is that you don't want to get embroiled into a family dispute. You don't want the matter to end up being contentious because you fueled that fire because of what you've said or what you haven't said. And I agree with you know Paul. Our I mean our our approach has always been to engage in any complaint from anyone. Um, more because we're a local law firm, so reputation, reputational damage is always something that we look to, we would always look to mitigate. But our response would be along the lines, you know, more so because we, you know, we're, we're making an assumption here that perhaps we haven't done anything wrong. It's more of a lack of communication between the executors and the beneficiaries, because typically that is tends to be the issue um, that the beneficiaries maybe aren't having that communication or it might be delayed because you're waiting for information from the executors. But also, so when you're dealing or when you're contemplating having to sort of acknowledge a complaint from somebody who's not sort of directly your client, you do have to obviously have that layer of, you know, your requirements under um, the code to be able to make sure that you're not breaching any confidentiality. So we've had a situation before now where a client or a beneficiary has been unhappy with their share but we haven't been able to really share a lot of information because the information that would have been on our on our file would have been confidential. And obviously, you know, the, the, the issue of confidentiality um, passes past someone's death. So we so we couldn't answer the questions because by doing so, we would have breached the, you know, the confidence of the person who made the will. And obviously, then while we were dealing with the estate. So I've, all I would say from a practical on the ground perspective those sort of cases do need to be managed by more senior members of staff because there's a lot of plates that you're going to spin to make sure you don't drop a large one. 
Thank you for that, Sarah. Rhiannon, do you have anything else to add to this? I think my colleagues have um, adequately responded to that one, so no, no thank you. We've uh, had a few questions come into the chat box, so I'll turn to those now. Um, we've had Ash ask, can the conduct of an unreasonable complainant amount to good cause to terminate a retainer? I'll open this up to whoever would like to go first. Um, That's a poor question. I'm quite happy to come in first. I mean, what I would always say in these circumstances, complaints ultimately are the sort of final line um, and really of your systems, controls and procedures. Um, in terms of unreasonable conduct, it is um, always a good idea to have a policy and it is always good to be open and transparent with your clients as to what behaviours you will accept and what behaviours you won't accept. Um, a number of firms don't have a policy, but it is always advisable. It is always good to set out, for example, where people aren't accepting complaints, um, you know, aren't accepting advice, are continually coming back and making unreasonable demands, uh, you know, looking um, for responses several times a day. Um, the Ombudsman has set out examples on their website in this scenario of how you should act. And there is some quite good guidance available on the Legal Ombudsman site. But what they do say is, you know, they upheld in one case that it was acceptable in those circumstances to explain that the additional time from dealing with these requests was going to add to the costs um, and, and to update that. In terms of whether it is reasonable to end a retainer, again, in some circumstances, yes, but do not use it as, as um, a um, sort of emotional springboard. I think in this case, you always do need to take a step back. Um, if somebody is being difficult and is getting extremely angry, you need to actually work out first of all, because, you know, invariably, if you, you know, disinstruct the, um, the, the um, client at a sensitive stage, it's going to end up at the ombudsman. So always have a look back and think, you know, what's driving that anger? Is it unreasonableness and just the fact that they're not behaving properly? Is it actually a case that you, you yourself have, um, have dropped the ball on a couple of occasions and some of that anger is, is legitimate? Where you feel that their behaviour is unreasonable, it is always, you know, in my view, appropriate to explain to the complainant um, why, you, you know, what the behaviour is why you feel it is unreasonable and how you believe they should be acting. Um, and also to explain in terms of transparency, what will happen if um, that behavior continues and they're not able to adjust. Um, in that case, um, if you then do have to take a, a decision and you've been transparent and you've been that clear as to um, what is um, the issue and what's causing it, um, you know, then, you know, if the unreasonable conduct continues, you are acting reasonably and the ombudsman has upheld that stance if you terminate the retainer. It is always, though, worth thinking about, um, you know, the stage that you're doing it at. Um, the ombudsman, for example, if you look on their website, has a, um, a case where, you know, somebody took umbrage because a, a, a one-off conversation got a bit heated and uh, they terminated the retainer the day before completion. And that was found to be unreasonable. Um, it's very important. It's not an emotional reaction. It's not almost um, you've fallen up, you've broken the rules, therefore I'm going to get back, back to you. You should be transparent. I'm not saying there aren't exceptional cases where somebody, you know, comes in with a gun or something, you know, where you would, you would want to issue a first warning. You know, there are extreme cases where it would be appropriate to say, you know, the uh, the level of misbehaviour is such it's a crime and you report it to the police and terminate straight away. But that that is exceptional. In the majority of cases, it would be appropriate to um, be clear with the complainant. It is very helpful to have a policy that you can refer them to and to actually explain, therefore, if they are acting contrary to that behaviour, why their you know, behaviour is unacceptable, the challenge it's, it's presenting to you and how you would like them to act and the consequences, then if it carries on beyond that, um, it can be justified. But do think about, you know, the implications and make sure that your decision is proportionate and reasonable. Thank you, Paul. Do uh, Rihanna or Sarah have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think, I think it's 
when a relationship's um, breaking or broken down. Um, I, I think terminating a retainer, in my mind, is is a real last last resort, and I don't think I've actually terminated one in my career because one would hope to resolve things in advance of that. Um, but but there are certain people who, you know, they they just simply. Um, you know, aren't going to accept anything that you're going to say, and the relationship has entirely broken down. In those circumstances, prior to ending any retainer, what I tend to do is outline the options to them. Um, of course, there is no gun to their head. They don't have to stay with you as a lawyer. There are, you know, hundreds of law firms out there. And, and you know, and, and giving them those opportunities and options of taking their file elsewhere. I do think the timing of it's important. Um, you know, a few days before trial, I don't think you would dream of doing that unless something's gone terribly wrong. And, and certainly other critical stages in the case. Um, because a number of these clients, of course, are just goading you and, and then they say, you just don't want to act for me, do you? And that's really at the heart of it, which, of course, you then go, no, 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 of course I want to act for you and try and step the way forward. But sometimes I think giving them the option to go elsewhere where they have no trust in you anymore and that they articulate that they have no trust in you, um, that is often the way to do it before you terminate. In fact, they've gone to instruct somebody else. So I think from a practical point of view, there are ways of overcoming this without simply dumping the client as they would perceive it to be, by giving them the options, outlining what's what, and, and failing that if they insist on staying with you. And I've had a few of these over the years as well, where I think, oh dear God, I wish you'd have gone elsewhere. But they do insist, you then set those boundaries, as Paul said, and I think it's really important to set boundaries. Um, swearing at team members for me is a real red flag to bill. I hate it. And I, I think it's so inappropriate. And I'm sure if you know one of our team were to use an appropriate language, you can imagine where that would end up. So we do set those very clear, clear boundaries that if we are then going to continue with the case, what those boundaries are, and that if these things continue to happen, then we will have no alternative at that stage than to terminate. Um, and I have to say, I think taking those steps certainly in my experience, has been effective to the point that I've not had to end one. But it's not to say I haven't had to have those difficult conversations. And it's ensuring that you do have those difficult conversations and, and make it very clear so that everybody understands the position, really. And I would just echo what Rhea said, that that's, you know, if the trust had been broken down, then we would try to do everything we could to accommodate a smooth transfer to another law firm if um, that's what they were wanting. Aaron, just to mention, there's a Q&A answer a question from Olivia um, that she'd posted a, a while back, which might be a fruitful one to share. That's brilliant. Thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, yes, <coughs> Olivia's question. Should we have separate ways of dealing with complaints about service, negligent advice and fee earnest conduct? Again, I shall leave this to the floor to decide. Despite between yeah. A re one probably is um um, yeah, I, I, I think if you wanted to split the complaints into those pockets, first of all, I think it's really important that your team, team members, understand what fits in each bucket. Um, because if they don't understand, then the, the process and procedure that you are going to have is, is broken before you start. So I think it's articulating and making it very clear of what sits insofar as possible. There is always grey, as we know, in the legal world and um, what sits in each bucket and then what, what that sort of escalation process is. So a complaint about a fee and generally a team manager should be able to deal with that. I think when it comes to negligence, um, that is a slippery slope if you were um, a very junior member of staff and not understanding the consequences of negligence and what that meant could in fact get you into a position of negligence and therefore ensuring those escalation um, positions are, are there and it's and, it, and it's you know straight upwards as it were or it could be that of course those are the minute you see the word negligence some people only want to deal with it on in paper and in writing i don't necessarily agree with that but but i think it's one that everybody understands um what goes in each pot and then what that process is and um, because they are different skill sets as well um you know a fear and a, a complaint about a fear and, a, and their misery over the phone and how they sound so doom and gloom, etc., um, is very, very different. And the consequences to a firm from a negligence, oh, potential negligence complaint, for example. So yeah, I, I think I don't see any problem in separating them as long as there are um, clear roadmaps of, you know, what goes in the pot and what happens 
when something hits that pot and who should then deal with it. What you don't want is mudding of the waters when the complainer calls up and says, I'm complaining about a fee in it. For example, if it ends in the wrong pot, the wrong pot says, ah, oh, no, I don't deal with that. So then you've got a who, who's responsible for it position. And then that person is pushed from pillar to post. And actually that's just going to make matters much worse. So yes, in principle, I like it to be very, very clear of, of what goes where and what the boundaries are. And for heaven's sake, nobody start passing the buck like a hot potato saying this one's not for me, because actually that's going to escalate it like no tomorrow. Shall I come in uh, next? Uh, um, it's an interesting. Sorry. No, sorry, I said. Sorry, come in, Aaron. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, that's fine. It's a, it's an interesting question. I mean, one of the points um, I would always make on this is that um, a firm doesn't have a professional obligation to correspond with clients about conduct allegations. So ultimately. Where the line does become a little bit blurred is that a firm does have an obligation to self-report if they are aware of any misconduct on their own part. So there is a slight dividing line if a client comes to you and alleges misconduct against one of your employees. I'd say, you know, back to the earlier question, if ever there is a reason for a, quite a senior person to look at an allegation of conduct, um, you know, it, it's probably in relation to those conduct allegations because... If there's any merit in it and there is potential need for a self-referral -re and a, um, a disciplinary action, then clearly it needs to be quite a senior manager who's looking at that, ensuring that there's a fair process and managing what are quite significant risks. But I wouldn't necessarily agree there needs to be a separate process because it's not going to be an appropriate in every case that um, you're going to want to correspond with it. I mean, you can always tell a complainant. If you believe there's misconduct, you can report it direct to the SRA and, and they will take it up with us and we will respond to it. It's only where, you know, those, those lines become a little bit blurred where you think actually there may be something in this and we need to investigate it as part of our duty because you shouldn't be turning a blind eye to potential misconduct given your um, self-reporting obligations. In terms of the, the issue as to whether there should be a separate um, negligence and... Um, you know, service um, procedure. I would say that's a little bit dangerous. Um, the lines of um, demarcation between um, professional negligence and and service are now not as as defined as uh, perhaps the legal um, complaint service. Again, going back to the um, when the law society used to sort of run the the complaints procedures and. The, L the LCS was very reluctant to get involved in anything that may potentially overlap with negligence. Um, that is no longer the case. The legal ombudsman has um, takes a view that um, the Legal Services Act, um, which states that um, it's not a requirement for a complaint there that it, that it can give rise in negligence, they take that to mean that um, nevertheless, if it if facts give rise to poor service and negligence that um, they're not precluded from investigating it. So an awful lot of the concerns that are raised with the firm where there are suggestions of negligence, that may just be in the language. Um, given that the Legal Service Ombudsman has um, jurisdiction to award compensation up to £50,000, that may well be where it, um, it lies. Um, if it's capable of being a service issue and it's being raised with you as a complaint, Normally, you should deal with it, um, but you do need to be careful in terms of negligence. So again, communication with a complainant, if they are wishing to raise legal action, um, if it's a very complex issue, you know, there, there is the right to seek the ombudsman, dismisses it on the basis it's better dealt with by the court. Um, but it's dangerous to just say it's negligence, therefore we won't deal with it. I mean, because then after eight weeks, it can be escalated to the legal ombudsman, who in most cases will actually take the view that if it's a relatively straightforward matter and it can be dealt with under their jurisdiction to look at poor service, then they will deal with it. Where I would say, you know, given that there is that degree of overlap and ambiguity between the respective jurisdictions, if you are ever minded to um, make admissions and, um, you know, it doesn't apply quite so much if you're not upholding the complaint and you're writing back to say, well, it's not unreasonable service. But if you are making admissions um, and the complainant is potentially seeking far larger damages that might go beyond the ombudsman's jurisdiction, 
it is always wise to speak to your indemnity insurers before issuing that final response because what you don't want to do in those circumstances is invalidate your indemnity insurance. So um, it is, I have come across instances actually where there is that degree of friction. The indemnity insurers say, oh, we'll wait till we get a pre, you know, pre protocol letter. But do you think in the likelihood is that we're going to have to deal with this under the Ombudsman? Um, it's worth communicating. But in most cases, I would recommend that you seek to actually issue the complaint, dealing with it as a service issue unless it's abundantly clear that the complainant is serious, then they are going down a negligence route, in which case, you know, then pass it on to your indemnity insurers and deal with it separately. Is it worth me squeezing an answer in, Aaron? Um, okay. I would literally be only sort of 60 seconds. I, I would say that if your culture's right, having a different process or different ways of dealing with it, I definitely think can work. So in relation to service, um, we would ideally want, you know, fee owners to be able to, you know, try to mend those fences where possible. Anything that had the sniff of negligence, we would want to bypass any fee owners or heads of department. It would be escalated to somebody who would have the expertise to see whether there is any grounds and for it to be handled the right, as Paul has alluded to. And then obviously conduct again, you know, we wouldn't be adverse to it going through a different process um, with people who might have the expertise to be able to give the right advice, point people in the right direction and decide whether things need to be escalated. So I think if you've got the right culture of transparency, then I definitely think uh, making sure people are being used for the right thing from a management and leadership perspective, as well as a compliance perspective, is the way to go. And I like what Tanya had put in the chat about having a red, amber, green. Really like that. So that was my answer. Thank you, Sarah. Um, there are some more questions in the chat box, but unfortunately, that's all we've got time for today. Of course, you can feel free uh, to email, to reach out to uh, the panellists here today. On that note, I want to thank Rihanna and Paul and Sarah today for everything you've shared. I don't doubt that everyone here has taken away a lot of value in that. Um, a recording of the webinar, as always, will be sent to everybody tomorrow. And uh, this afternoon, you should receive an email asking to rate the webinar out of five stars. If you have enjoyed, please do leave feedback as well as suggestions for future topics, future roundtable discussions that we can have like we have had today. Um, so one more time, thank you again to all the panelists. Thank you to everyone for attending and have a great afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.